we, we sank a probe, we saw... It was the first season. Yes, we saw a, a, a piece of pottery glaring back up at us uh, that looked glazed. And the first thing I thought was, wait a minute, what's a piece of Islamic... That would be like Muslim era. Yeah, yeah not, what's a piece of ancient. Islamic pottery doing down right. way down here? So I picked it up and looked at it and go, oh, it's not. It's Middle Bronze Age pottery, but it's melted on the surface. It's just superficially melted. The man who discovered Sodom, we're going to talk to him tonight. It's a fascinating story and one that you need to hear because if there's any story in the Bible that the world does not want to believe it's true, it has to be the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It seems like just one of these crazy Bible mytho mythological stories that can't, you can't really believe that there was a city that were two cities that God just decided that people wouldn't listen to him and his word, to his people, to his servants, and then decide to rain fire and brimstone from heaven and wipe the thing off the planet. Like, that's, <laughs> that just couldn't happen, right? But this man that we're going to talk to absolutely not only believes it did happen, but that he knows where it is, having discovered Sodom and Gomorrah as well, uh, when the rest of the world hasn't seen it or understood it or even believed it existed for... 37 centuries, something like that. Dr. Stephen Collins, welcome to the Rosenberg Report. Good to be here, Joel. Thank you so much. Uh, look, uh, there's so much we're going to get into, I think, in this show, and, and certainly it's going to take another show to unpack this, to, to dig this out. But um, I want to start with the, the basic premise, right, is that for most of, certainly the 20th century, but I would say probably well before, but in the, in the modern, sophisticated, scientific era, nobody really believes that there's a Sodom, that the biblical story from Genesis is, is, is just mythology, has no bearing in reality. Isn't that the, hasn't that been up to the present, the, the basic common conventional wisdom? That has generally been the case, but um, Joel, when you do science, you don't rely on belief. It doesn't matter what I believe or what somebody else believes. The only thing that really matters is what is the evidence on the ground? Right. Well, okay. But the, the challenge with that is that people would say, well, if it doesn't exist, why look for it? Right. It, you know, nobody's looking for the Shire. Nobody's looking for Mount Mordor from the Tolkien uh, novels. Right. So so there's it's sort of a waste of time to try to take an archaeological scientific approach to something that everybody knows doesn't even exist. So, again, let's start with that premise. Here's the way to approach that. Okay. The Bible isn't is ancient literature. Right. It's ancient Near Eastern literature. We know across the board that all authors in the ancient world, everyone who wrote every genre of ancient Near Eastern literature, whether the Babylonians, the Hittites, the Egyptians, Canaanites, whoever they were, they never invented fictitious geographies. This was not, we don't have things like Middle Earth and Five Acre Wood. There weren't novelists. Yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly. more recent. We didn't have little James <laughs> Missioners running around in the ancient hey, world. Hey, Joel Rosenberg's, you know. Yeah. But anyway, and, Mitchell, and, um, Mitchell's good. Leon, you're so, so at that base level, the base level of geography, when the Bible talks about the location of the cities of the plain, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, these five cities, they are not making up the geography. In fact, there's so many points of geodata, I call it, when you mine the geodata out of the text, you come up with the so... The biblical text. The biblical text, talking about Genesis 13, Genesis 14. There's so much specific information about the location of these cities that you would practically have to be blind and, and illiterate not to be able to find the location of Sodom because there are at least 25 known pieces of geography that you can triangulate between to take you to the city of Sodom. Okay, it's not difficult. That starts with your premise that, uh, that, that you're directly countering the conventional wisdom of the world, which is that first of all, the Bible is not true, and Sodom and Gomorrah didn't exist. That you're, you're directly countering that, saying, "Well, you're starting with the premise: what if it did exist? You, you believe it existed? What if it did exist?" But then we have to add in Christian uh, archaeology, right? Uh, uh, um, Dr. Albright, roughly a hundred and so years ago, he told us all that, <laughs> that he knew where Sodom was, and it was in the southern sector of the Dead Sea. So that was pretty much the conventional wisdom. Even you yourself were teaching it because you just thought, well, that's, that guy's the, the dean. He's the master of anybody who believes in the Bible 
and believes in Sodom, and he says it's in the Southern Dead Sea. So, but something, but now you're challenging that as well. Yes, because, and, and I know Albright's work very, very well. Here's the problem with Albright's location of Sodom. He never, ever provides an exegesis of Genesis chapter 13, which is the verbal map to get to the city of Sodom. He never, ever did that. He just basically shot off the top of his head. Here's what he said. The southern area of the Dead Sea looks like a place God would have destroyed by fire. Well, I don't disagree with that. <laughs> if, you, pretty desolate if you spent pretty, you much know, yeah. time down there like I have, yeah, you look around, you go, yeah, it's pretty desolate. It looks like uh, something happened here. But here's the problem. The southern end of the Dead Sea, and, and, and by the way, uh, this pushed me. It was the text, reading the text and noticing, wait a minute, I've, I've taught that Sodom was at the south end of the Dead Sea for years. I've said that. I've taught it. We did a, a special that even wound up on CBS primetime, and I'm talking about the southern Sodom. But when I actually went back and read the text, I thought, well, wait a minute. There's nothing in the in Genesis 13 or 14 or 19 that would locate Sodom toward the okay. south end of the uh, Dead we're gonna Sea. We're going to get back. We're going to get because those specifics are really important. But uh, but I'm but I want just people right up front to see that there's a there's a that you're really taking a very direct stand uh, based on your both beliefs but also your archaeological experience of now more than 20 years against the the standard view the standard view a in the secular world the Bible is mythology and Sodom and Gomorrah weren't real. And the standard view within Christendom for the last hundred or so years, which is, no, 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 it, the Bible is true and Sodom and Gomorrah are real, but they're located where the, the master of, uh, of yeah. Christian archaeology. To say that Sodom is mythical is a presupposition that cannot be supported by geographical study, by science, or by archaeology. It can't be supported. This is a belief system. Okay. It's not science. When you do the science of Sodom, you go to the text first. Why? Because the Bible is the only place, the only ancient text that has survived with the name Sodom in it and the detailed geography about it and the other cities of the plain. That has to be dealt with. It's a primary text. Okay, okay, but there's still another view. Uh, I mean, it's still another challenge that you're up against, which I want to put right up front in this show, which is if the Bible were true and if Sodom and Gomorrah really existed. And if the biblical account is accurate in every detail, from geography to the, the magnitude of the city, the wealth, the, uh, and then, of course, the carnality, the sin, and then what God says, look, if you don't listen, there is a consequence to your behavior that I'm not going to look away. I'm going to... There, there is a, there is a, there's a point of no return. The world doesn't want to hear that. The, the, the rampant sin, rampant homosexuality becomes the absolute, like, like, you can't even talk about that in this day and age. We're sitting here in Jerusalem where there's an annual gay pride parade in Jerusalem. There's an even larger one in Tel Aviv. So the entire world has pretty much said, this is a good thing. And moreover, if there is a God at all, which most people aren't sure about, but even if there is, he certainly doesn't have rules. He doesn't certainly have a, a desire for people to live the way he intended them to live. And he certainly doesn't bring consequences. You're hitting every single, you know, you've got the, 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 the convergence of almost every um, worldview system that's against Christianity, Judaism, biblical Judaism, and the Bible. You're, you're confronting all of it when you're trying to understand, is Sodom and real and have you found it? It's interesting to hear that. Uh, what you just said, because it, it, it is true, the way people approach this, why people want to reject the idea that Sodom could be a real place. But here's the problem with that. Does a city that was, in fact, the largest continuously occupied Bronze Age city in the entire region simply cease to exist because somebody doesn't want to believe that it existed? There's really two questions that I want to ask you uh, that ha have are, that are critical in this conversation. The first is, why do you believe that you have found the actual city of Sodom and that it's located on the northeast edge of the Dead Sea and that it's not what Albright said and then others after him on the southern side? But the other thing is, what happened to this city that even 
secular scholars or scholars that are not biblical believers, they're not followers of Jesus Christ, have said a massive cataclysmic airburst happened that fried everything in that area and left it barren for 700 years. These two elements, I think, are critical to people understanding, are you right? So let's start with the location. There isn't a single site, archaeological site, in the Southern Dead Sea region that dates in the time of Abraham. Really? Every single site down there was completely out of business due to climate change <laughs> by around 2500 BC. That's 500 years at least for the very, from the very earliest time that Abraham can be placed in history. So you can start by, your, your, your premise then is, you start by ruling out that there could be something there because there, was, there is nothing there. Right. And, and no archeologist would disagree with what I just said. And why would they put a city in a place that potentially could get flooded and, and, and the city would be overwhelmed, right? Yeah, if you put it where Albright said, you know, down in the, uh, the Dead Sea Southern Basin, yeah. uh, he said, perhaps the cities were there and when God destroyed it, maybe there was an earthquake and the ground sank and the Dead Sea flooded over it. Well, now the Dead Sea is, is dry. Right. And uh, archeologists go down there and look around. There isn't sherd one, you know, are diamonds forever? Yes, but sherds are too. They never go away, right? And uh, so there are no towns there. Why would you build a settlement in a, what is essentially a sump when every time it rains, it's going right. to f flood in? The other element, which is, while we didn't call it the Dead Sea in the Bible, it was called the Salt Sea. There wasn't anything growing down there. It wasn't like a, a flourishing, teeming, this is where you'd build a, a right. metropolis. But of course, this whole region of the Jordan River Valley was, you know, was so amazing that it was almost the the, the Middle Eastern equivalent of the uh, of the Nile or 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 the uh, let's say the Mississippi River. I mean, this was so gorgeous and so lush that that Lot himself said, um, "I would like that territory. If you're if we're going to divide Abraham and me, that's the territory I want because it's so fertile." Yes. And, uh, but that's the northern Let me give side. you a thumbnail of the geography of, of the Jordan. Now, these are called the cities of the plain. The Kikar, the circle of the Jordan. Of the Jordan. What does the Jordan mean? It means the descending or the descent of what? The fresh water. Okay, the Dead Sea is the dead part of the Rift Valley. The Jordan is the living water part of the, uh, of the Rift Valley. Here's what the Old Testament says. Now, you can put... 25 or 30 different scripture verses together here and, and come up with what I'm about to say. The Bible clearly says that the Jordan, the descending, ends at the Bay of the Dead Sea, at the mouth of the Jordan, below Pisgah, which is, is Nebo. That's north of the Dead Sea. So this is a lock. Hmm. And when we talk about Lot and Abraham parting ways, where were they? They were at Bethel and Ai. It says that Lot, and that's 12 miles north of Jerusalem. So they were at Bethel and I, it says, Lot lifted up his eyes and looked over and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered like the garden uh, of God, like, like Egypt. Had a river running through it. It overflowed its banks. It was a little Nile in miniature. Uh, it was this beautiful, you as a, you described. A note on another uh, conversation you had with someone that since Genesis was written by Moses, Moses was pretty familiar with yeah. what Egypt looked like. And uh, it was an interesting reference point to... Yeah, only somebody like Moses yeah. who grew up in Nilotic civilization would really be captured by the way the hydrology of the Jordan Valley works. But then it says very clearly, and this is something that the I, I always say the Southern Sodom advocates never mention this. They never ask this question. The proper question to ask in the location of Sodom is, where was Lot standing when he lifted up his eyes and saw the, the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered. He was Bethel and I. And then it says from there... You wouldn't have been able to see the southern end of the... No, you can barely on a good day like today <laughs> see the north end of the Dead Sea, that's all. And then it says he traveled eastward, forward, and pitched his tent Ad Sedom, as far as Sodom. Okay. There's, we're going to get into that more, and either in the next show or maybe we'll have to do the extended, uh, you know, YouTube exclusive because the because the location is critical. You end up finding this swath, not just of one tell or you know archaeological mound, but but multiple sites, some of which had been had some archaeological uh, exploration, yes. but but not this particular Tel Al Amam site. But there's another piece, which is as you start digging, um, not in the first year, not in the second year, but it's eventually you. You hit something, uh, one of your volunteers, I think, or maybe staff, finds something that looks like 
basically rock that had turned into glass in New Mexico when they use nuclear explosions, right? And you're from New Mexico, you're yeah. based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. But so describe that moment and what in the world could have caused sand or rock to turn to glass in the Near East? I picked a site. Pre, pre-nuclear yeah, weapons. Yeah, I, I picked this a site uh, right in the swale of the upper city. Uh, because it was the lowest point on the upper city. And so we put a, a two by two meter probe to go straight down and see just a test probe to see how deep the Middle Bronze Age destruction layer actually right. was. Well, we got underneath the Iron Age and then we jumped back immediately 700 years and we were on the Middle Bronze Age destruction matrix based on the, the ceramics. Because you're not the, finding archaeology from anything for the next no. 700 years. Right. So That's, you're going straight exactly. through to... As soon as we got under the Iron Age, time. we jumped back 700 years we're in the Middle Bronze Age, and as soon as we get a few centimeters into that matrix, this piece of pottery, shoulder of a storage jar, is facing up at us, and it looks like it's glazed. Let's say you find an archaeological site, and you think it's Sodom. What would you have to find there? You would have to find cataclysmic destruction, because the Bible says fire and brimstone fell from heaven and wiped out this civilization, and it pretty much wasn't inhabited again for 700 years. So... Is that what you found? <laughs> yes. Um, it, was, it was actually, Joel, the biblical text that put us at this site. We just simply navigated around the geography. This is where we were. Now, we have to excavate. And as we began excavating 18 years ago now, um, one of the first things we found in the, it actually was the very first season, we, we sank a probe. We saw- oh, It was the first season. Okay. Yes, we saw a, a, a piece of pottery glaring back up at us uh, that looked glazed. And the first thing I thought was, wait a minute, what's a piece of Islamic... That would be like Muslim yeah, era. Yeah, not, what's a piece of ancient. Islamic pottery doing down right. way down here? So I picked it up and looked at it and go, oh, it's not. It's Middle Bronze Age pottery, but it's melted on the surface. It's just superficially melted. In fact, there was a little, about a one and a half, two millimeter flow of that glass over the edge of the break. Mm -hmm. It didn't even stay melted long enough for it to flow any further than that. So it was obviously a flash heat. Okay. And um, so I tossed it up like this, and one of our workers who happened to be part of the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos Laboratories uh, back in, in World War II era, um, who knew, who was at the Trinity site near Alam Alamogordo when they blew up the first atomic bomb, and w which caused a melted surface of, uh, of, of the sand right, right. in that area. So he catches it, and he says, wow, that looks like Trinitite. I had never heard that word before. I said, what's that? But that was the Operation Trinity, I think was the call, the, the, the secret yeah, operation to yeah, yeah. do this detonation. Exactly. And uh, so he was there, and he knew this stuff. So in the, in the brief time we have for this show, we're going to have to talk about it more on the next show, but but what could have caused that, right? And, and, and there's this fascinating article that has now been published about two years ago with 21 scholars saying what? Saying that the entire area, 400 square kilometers around Tal Hamam, including Tal Hamam itself, sort of as the epicenter of the explosion, was wiped out in the blink of an eye by a meteoritic or bolide airburst. A large piece of space debris, like an uh, asteroid or comet fragment, came into the atmosphere. We know from the southwest, exploded, hit upon the ground as plasma, and wiped out an entire civilization. It's amazing because... You think, well, first of all, the level of destruction that's described in the Bible would also make a skeptic or, or certainly a cynic go, no, that's, that's not possible. First of all, God wouldn't do that if there is a God. But secondly, that's just not literally humanly possible. So, and then if there's no evidence, then you think, well, you know, but what you're describing is something that, that even 21 scholars, most of them not biblical, you know, Christ followers, and a peer-reviewed, multiple-time peer-reviewed article saying, there was something crazy cosmic that yeah. happened at that particular spot. They're not claiming that it proves that Sodom and Gomorrah were real, but they do mention the biblical Honest, account honestly, in their 64-page article. They don't care, and they tell me all the time, we have no dog in your fight, Collins. We don't care if it's Sodom or whatever it is. We are airburst physicists, astrophysicists, scientists. Mm -hmm. All we care about is studying what happened at your site. You can do with it what you want. Hey, I'm Mati Shoshani, and thank you for watching the TBN Israel YouTube channel. We hope this video gave you greater understanding of Israel and her people. If you haven't already, 
subscribe to our channel, and hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. We'd love to hear from you, so be sure to share what you've learned and ask your questions in comments below. And invite your friends to join the conversation.